A very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for being in attendance for this town hall. My name is Lee Theater, the project coordinator for Future Climate Leaders. And tonight we're gonna to be talking about you, the consumer, the individual in the equation of climate change solutions. This evening we have joining us, Julie Denis from the local Phil located in Cornwall, Ontario. We also have Glenn Forrester, one half of the wonderful team that makes up the operations that is Ground Soap, which is also located in Cornwall, Ontario. And so these fine folks are gonna help paint a picture of what your choices look like out in the market. When we talk about climate change, when we talk about solutions, one of the challenges that we have is trying to determine what are all the options that are available. When we're asked to change our behaviors and our habits, what do those options look like? How can we make better choices? So I'm happy that you're here today. I'm happy that this conversation is as local as it's going to get. And if there's an opportunity to be interrupted, we have a wonderful technician on the back end to ensure that you folks at home are gonna be taken care of. If you have any questions, that question period will take place at the very end of this conversation, probably about 15 minutes out. So be sure to sit on them for a little bit and enjoy this conversation. Tonight, I'm gonna to start my conversation off with Julie. Julie, tell me, who are you? What is your organization and where are you from? And then we're gonna keep this conversation going. Hi everyone, my name is Julie Dennis. I'm from the local Phil in Cornwall. Uh, we're located at uh, 1515 Pitt Street. Uh, we share the building with Summit Health and Fitness next to the brick. Um, and we're your local refill and uh, sustainability market. Fantastic. Now, moving down to Glenn Forrester. Glenn, who are you? What organization do you represent? And where are you located? I'm Glenn, and I'm from Ground Soap. And we're located at 2107 2nd Street West. That's where our manufacturing is. Uh, and we don't have a store of our own. We sell mostly to, uh, to wholesale uh, stores, um, grocery and organic specialty stores uh, around Ontario and through the US and a little bit in Europe. Fantastic. So I'm going to pause right now and I'm just going to explain to folks what a, uh, a supply chain looks like. You'll have a manufacturer on one end that is producing a raw good. That manufacturer is then going to move it down to a seller, a middleman, a middle person, an entity called the wholesaler. Wholesaler is going to have retailers. Retailers, like our lovely Julie, are then able to pick from different products that are available and then sell them to us, the consumer. And so when we think of the grand scheme of a supply chain, and we've got a producer that is maybe producing products that are not sustainable, or maybe they're producing um, in a way that isn't sustainable. Um, there are certain methodologies that we have to take a look at in terms of our supply chain. How can we push back? How can we ask for more? So moving from the manufacturer side down to a wholesaler, Glenn, when I'm thinking about your product, Round Soap, describe to me how did it start? Why does it exist? And uh, what role do you play in the grand you know, sustainable ecosystem of choices? Um, well, it started uh, many years ago, 13 or 14 years ago, uh, with my wife, Angela. Um, and she was just looking for sort of a career, I guess. She was doing something at the time that wasn't really uh, you know, satisfying her. And uh, this was something um, that she had always wanted to do, you know, one of those sort of, this would be my dream kind of thing, but didn't know how to do it. And so, you know, talking about it once we... Uh, we kind of thought, okay, well, it's it's something that's possible. And then about six months later, it became a reality and we've been at it ever since. And the idea was um, that the product she would produce would be a little different than what was available commercially in that it would be uh, made with really, really good ingredients and, and that it would be, you know, as high quality as she could possibly make it. Um, and that the recipes for the soap in the end would, you know, kind of, uh, th there would be a, an interesting offering, you know, there would be a, a bunch of different things, but the idea would be that everything would be based in uh, ingredients that were grown um, from the earth. So basically all vegetarian, um, all uh, things that were, um, you know, just just uh, sustainable and, and able to be uh, acquired in a way that was sustainable and that would deliver to consumers a really good product in the end as well. And that was kind of the whole goal. And so we've been sort of pursuing that ever since and trying to find um, ways of doing that um, creatively. Uh, and, you know, 13 years ago, I think we looked at climate change a little differently than we do now. And I think that, you know, us particularly, we're in a position now where some of the things that we always dreamed of trying to do, uh, we can start to do that because we're, our scale is just a little bigger. And so we can ask, like where, you know, when you're starting, you can't ask things of your suppliers 
or of your supply chain. You know, you're, you're just part of that and you don't have much say in it. And I think the more leverage you get, um, the more you can sort of consider trying to affect that a little bit. And so that's where we're at now is we're, we're starting to think about things that we can uh, do further to make it even better, um, you know, to what we're doing even better and even more sustainable as we go forward. Thank you for that. I'm going to come back to you in just a moment. Oh, well, there's, there's Steve. our manufacturer, Steve. Oh, hey, guys. In. <laughs> it's a party. So this is Steve from Etsy. We'll come back to you in a second, Steve. I'm going to go back up to Julie. Julie, I'm interested in knowing about the local film. Why did you start it? Um, what are we trying to achieve? And what's the benefit of your location? What's your story? So the how it came about was I had been an interior designer for 20 years and um, just as the years went on, I noticed how much as a consumer, we would just buy things to to, you know, well, in the interior design field, it was basically beautifying your space. So there was a lot of a lot of waste created and we would just buy things because we wanted to keep up with the Joneses or we wanted something nicer when everything we had was perfectly fine. Mm. And the more I matured and the more I saw that and I was just uh, embracing the minimalist um, in my life, I just saw that I was being overwhelmed with all the waste that we were creating with the renovating and so on. So I said, okay, that was... That was it for me. And after 20 years, I, I thought it was time for a career change. So I did speak with my husband and he said, do whatever you want. And I had already started refilling and driving to Ottawa to, which wasn't very sustainable, but it was my only option at the time. So refilling my bottles in an Ottawa at a store very similar to ours. And then I asked my husband, you know, is it okay if I do this? And how about this? If we do a store similar to the one in Ottawa? And he said, let's do it. So timing was perfect. I saw a hole in the market where, you know, consumers were really looking to embrace the, you know, sustainable lifestyle. So I thought I'm going to give them a place that I love in Ottawa, close to home. Sounds like opening up a Caribbean restaurant, but we won't talk about that. So Steve, <laughs> welcome to the party, sir. I'm not going to dock you points for being late, but we did drink uh, all of your uh, earlier lobby drinks. So I mean, you're, you're, you're out to lunch for this one. But Steve, welcome to this conversation. Um, I'm going to give you an opportunity. I'd like to know who you are, what organization, and uh, what is the scope of your organization? And we'll just go back up to Julie in just a moment. But Steve, please, who are you? All right, did we already have a conversation about your bow tie and fantastic jacket? <laughs> Buddy, that conversation happens towards the end. You didn't get to find out the itinerary, but yes, we can certainly talk about the bow tie. <laughs> all right, all right. We'll talk about it later. Um, so Etsy, Etsy stands for Everything Touches Everything Else. And it is an organization, a business that I started with my friend a few years back. And I would say, like, where did it actually begin? It probably began through a combination of experiences. One, uh, being an avid whitewater kayaker. So if you are into whitewater kayaking, you know that springtime is when the water is beautiful. Mm. It's cold, but it's super high. And I like to surf on big river waves and the waves are the biggest in the spring. One spring, I was trying to stay a little more local. I'm originally from Toronto. So I was in downtown Toronto. Where do you go? You go to the Don Valley, you go to the Credit River all the things around the edge of Toronto and what was happening in those rivers, it boggled my mind. They were full of plastic. So I just missed the big high flood and I came back a little later and I saw like, it's crazy the amount of plastic in the trees, like crazy. In the trees. Yeah. Yeah. In trees because the water had been up into the trees and then it receded. And I still have some pictures I can show you guys sometime. It's crazy how much plastic flows through the trees because spring flood brings all the wonderful water, but it also brings all the trash. Mm -hmm. And so it was things like that. It was being up in the Northwest Territories. I was lucky enough to be a guide up in the Northwest Territories for a period of time, running big trips. And it was always weird to me. I felt like I was traveling, as I would describe it, in a Gore-Tex bubble, meaning like Gore-Tex is like the yeah, material of jackets and stuff like that. We were not living off the land, we would be bringing all of our food and we would package it in plastic. 
because of bears and things like that, we could not carry garbage because we'd be on trips for like 30 days at a time. So you couldn't carry your garbage. So you end up burning the plastic part way through the trip. It seemed totally the antithesis of what we should have been doing. It didn't make sense. So this stuff was all in the back of my mind through the years. And I didn't, I remember in university talking to my friends and saying, if, if you want to make a change, stop talking about NGOs, nothing against NGOs, but it was something that, that kind of drove me crazy because everyone at the university I went to wanted to graduate and start an NGO or work for an NGO. And I'm like, why not start a business? Because if you start a business, you can make change super, super fast. And you can get people to vote with their wallets to take actions. And if you make it exciting and interesting and all this sort of stuff, then that's how you do it. So jump ahead. It's like 2017. Um, I had been doing stuff in the music industry. I've been doing all sorts of stuff. I had an MBA, all these cumulative experiences. And I found myself kind of at a crossroad. And I'm like, what the fuck am I going to do next? Sorry, I shouldn't be swearing. Um, I'm like, what am I going to do next? I don't know. And my buddy and I had both had some experience selling stuff online. We're like, let's sell some shit online. And then we started to look at what we wanted to sell. And I started to realize, man, if if I'm going to assume, let's just assume my business is successful, right? Mm -hmm. If my business is successful, it's one thing to buy a product that isn't good for the environment. It's another thing to create tens of thousands, if you're lucky, millions of products that are not good for the environment. Mm -hmm. And we started, when we started looking at things, we were like, okay, we're going to drop ship. We're going to get stuff overseas. And, and I started to feel sick to my stomach. I'm like, this is not what I want to attach my name to. This is not what I want my legacy business to be. This is not the business I want to pass on to my kids down the line. I want something that actually makes a difference. And so all these experiences through my life, these canoe trips, seeing the plastic in the rivers, coalesce to what I thought was like a really great opportunity and that would be to rid the world of single-use plastics and then since then we've got even further and um this is where it'd be great to talk to Julie at some point because the neck to me the the real issue with single-use plastics which ties in both single-use plastics and carbon emission emissions is one single ingredient that is in almost every household product in almost every product in um julie's store and ah. it's, it's, yeah, there it is it's water water is actually to me the root problem you get rid of water then you get rid of plastic and you get rid of emissions because even like when you go to to a dis, dis uh a fillery you are still getting dish soap that is 70 to 90 percent water you remove the water all of a sudden you're massively reducing emissions and you're also getting rid of plastic so that's kind of my thing my excitement my focus right now is concentrates how do we get rid like almost like twisting our brains around mm -hmm. plastic's not the problem water's the problem how do we get rid of water then we do a one-two punch and we get rid of plastic and emissions so there's my long diatribe you brought it in. Now, I think you said Etty once. What does Etty sell? So we sell alternatives to single-use plastic, largely in concentrate form right now. Dish soap, hand soap, all-purpose cleaner, toothpaste, shampoo, conditioner, um, lotion bars, courtesy of my friend Glenn over there. Um, all these kinds of items. Lip balm, also courtesy. Consumer-based items, then. I'm taking it. Things that I'm going to be using. Items. Okay. Yeah. So now I'm going to go back up to Julie because I'm interested. All of you are guys, you folks are like champions within your respective spaces, but you came into that moment because you recognize something. So what I have learned through my process in this project is everybody enters into this conversation, into this train of thought at different points. Um, what inspired you, Julie, to get involved? What inspired you, Glenn, to get involved? What inspired you, Steve? So that came out in your stories. What the task is and the challenges for the average person is to come into a moment of their life to say, you know what, this doesn't agree with me. And then they begin the journey to say, what else doesn't agree with me? How else can I become a better person to get closer to that sense of like self? So Julie, you said that you enjoyed going up to Ottawa, shopping at this particular location, and this particular location served a need in your life. And you felt that you wanted to bring it back to our community here. 
So through the lens of you, what is it that you, be, be, it was the waste of being in your own industry and seeing that waste and then in your own life, choosing not to be wasteful mm-hmm. and then exporting out that idea of, well, if I'm getting a good kind of habit out of this, how many other people can I get involved in this? Why did you choose to be a retailer? Why did you choose? Because the amount of education that I'm thinking of the person who walks in on day one and doesn't know anything. Is there a relationship value in terms of taking somebody who doesn't know about uh, sustainability to come into your shop? Like, what makes you get up and go to work every day? So there was a, there's a lot of answers here that I need to spit out. <laughs> so one is the good part about having new customers come into the store, new consumers, is that these people are ready to invest in sustainable retail. Um, the issues on climate change, excess Uh, water waste, unethical labor practices um, are much more salient and and the customers are tuned in. Mm -hmm. So when the consumer walks into my store, a lot of it is, um, it's a clean slate. So I do get to educate them on a lot of things um, from ground zero. Um, I do have to fight a little bit with the greenwashing because they'll say, well, what about this? And what about that? And, you know, this company is supposed to be really good. And it's like a lot of times the wool has been pulled over the eyes. And so um, we do a lot of educating. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, what products can replace products that we're already buying that are plastic. and, And that's the majority of the store is that the, the store is, you walk in, you bring containers. If not, we have some that are there for you. Um, And then we, we educate them on the products that we sell. It's all natural, mostly organic. Um, You know, there's concentrated products, there's organic olive oils and, and so on. So it's hugely an educational thing. So whenever, what makes me tick is, getting to to that fresh person every day and, you know, starting a relationship and getting them educated from the get go, you know, just don't fall for all the greenwashing. Let's go right to the root. This is it. And, and it just blossoms from there. I'm pretty friendly. So I have a good connection with all my customers. Fantastic. So Julie, I'm going to come back to you and ask you to define greenwashing in a second. But Glenn, I want to come back down to you, sir. What gets you out of bed? What is the function of the products that you produce? What are you trying to um, bring to my attention? What habits are you trying to foster through the use of your products? Well, I think the products for any manufacturer, they're, they're sort of what you've decided to make and you've made decisions, uh, you know, through that process of, of making those, you know, those products. But once you do that um, and you've sort of set the course of that, the things that I feel that, that I want to change um, as a business owner would be things like the supply chain, because that's the one thing that we can't control. You know, like I, I don't know how many times we get raw material here that's in plastic hmm. and it's consistently that way. Um, that's one thing. Uh, another thing that that uh, bothers me that I don't know that there's a whole lot that we can do about it um, is just the way that things are shipped. You know, we need to get things from overseas. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I know that uh, sea shipping is probably, you know, per pound the best way of doing that. Um, but still, there's better ways, you know. And, and one thing that frustrates me is that as businesses and as consumers, um, we don't get to really choose those right yet, you know, and, and I, I find myself as a consumer asking myself all the time, well, what can I do at home that would, you know, besides buying an electric car, which I also think, you know, if you want to affect climate change, that's one of the, the easiest things that you could do is stop using fossil fuels, you know, like that's, that's really what's, what is the problem here. So if our supply chains could, could migrate more to being electrified, that would go so far to helping every business on earth conduct business in a more environmentally friendly way. As long as, you know, you can provide options for, for just consumers and for businesses to use things in a, a carbon neutral way or um, find ways of doing the things that we all have to do as businesses. We're not going to stop trading. That's not go- ever going to happen. We just have to find ways of doing it um, that, that is um, more environmentally friendly and not using carbon to do it. Um, and so, you know, those things, it's a little bit, 
sad that, you know, we have to look down the road at that. But at the same time, we need to be able to sort of put our foot down and say, well, no, let's let's instead of investing in, you know, fossil fuel subsidies to find more fossil fuels in our country, why aren't we taking that same money and investing it into an electrified, you know, supply chain? Um, more more automated electric vehicles on the road. I know that we're trying to get there, but we won't try to get there or we could get there faster if we if we took some subsidies that we're using for fossil fuels and and just applied them to that. It seems obvious to me that, you know, we as a as a country should be making those decisions for our citizens and for our business owners. That's what I'd like to see happen. Um, okay. the sooner. See, and so what I like about that is you're, you're indicating that there should be more market selection. There should be more ability for us as individuals to go to the market and say, I want these options. What are, but who's in charge of putting those market forces out for us? Um, I'm going to yep. come back to you in a second, uh, but I, I want to ask you, Steve, um, the product that you're producing or the line of products that you're producing within the grand scheme of the manufacturing side of things, what is it that you're trying to um, displace? What is it that you're trying to teach through your uh, approach to business? Um, what changes um, does your organization try to move into our arena of awareness? So what we're trying to displace, I think the main thing, like I said, my main focus right now is this education around water. Because like I said, I think there's so much education around plastic now. Um, and I think what my like latest epiphany has been is, man, we could solve the plastic problem tomorrow. Let's say we could snap our fingers and everything that is currently packaged um, <clears throat> in plastic is in some biodegradable alternative. And I'm not, again, I'm not thinking more about Julie's store. I'm thinking about like the like the Loblaws, the Costco's, all this stuff. So you walk through the aisles of those stores and everything's now biodegradable. I, I still don't think that you have really solved the problem because you're still in a single use situation and you are um, still in this major issue of uh, supply chain in terms of the, the mass volume. So the things that Glenn was just touching on um, become really apparent when you actually walk into a warehouse. And this was really fascinating. We have a supplier for our shampoo who makes both bottled shampoo and makes our bar shampoos, which are just a purely concentrated shampoo. And what she said is um, she loves making our shampoo, not because of like the environmental reasons or all this sort of stuff, but because it's so efficient and it takes up so much space, so little space in her warehouse. And so you can ah. see in a really practical level what happens when you suck all the water out. Because all of a sudden she has an order of like, say, 2,000 units for us. It takes up, you know, 10 square feet of her warehouse. I'm, I'm totally estimating. I don't yeah, know. Yeah. <laughs> when she has it in bottles because each of our shampoo bars is equal to about two bottles of shampoo, it's like five times, six times the size. And so you can see at a really practical level, that's just like a thousand units we're talking about or 2000 units. Imagine if you scale that up towards the millions and billions of household products that are purchased every day. Imagine if we got rid of the water, all of a sudden supply chain completely changes. So that's what I would like to disrupt. I'd like to suck the water out of household consumables. That is something that I want to come back to you. I'm going to give you the idea of South Africa's water countdown, Steve, and I'm going to come back to that conversation in a second. Cool. But I would like to end our next cycle of conversation with Julie. So Julie, you remember the word greenwashing, right? So I'm going to mm -hmm. come back in a second, but I'm going to start with you, Steve, for a second. So <clears throat> In my thinking of this conversation, I wanted to get a manufacturer. I wanted to get um, a, um, I wanted to get like a, uh, a wholesaler of sorts, a middle person of sorts, a manufacturer, but I also wanted to get a retailer. And so with you, with Etty, your, your global organization, right? I'm, I'm, I'm coming to you as a person who's not aware of everything that I could be doing. You're my first entry point. Um, 
what are the things that I as a consumer should be aware of, like beyond just at tea? Like what, what, how do we make this not just about your product, but a way of living? What are some things that a person should be aware of and approaching with uh, in mind in terms of the environment, in terms of um, finite uh, resources, in terms of uh, being sustainable? What would you say to me to, to help encourage me along the path? Um, simple daily actions, meaningful lasting change, do not blame yourself. Put more pressure on corporations and on government institutions. I think recycling is a perfect example. Um, let's talk Bath and Body Works. This is something we've been talking about because Bath and Body Works, I'm gonna call it a large organization. Um, they are famous for their seasonal hand soaps. So we're coming up to the holiday season. They're gonna have holiday scented hand soaps. Pumpkin spice everything. Pumpkin spice, everything. You got it. And then their Christmas soaps and all this sort of stuff. And each season, they're going to come out with a different one. And each of those are going to be uh, packaged in a plastic container. And if you flip over the bottom of that plastic container, you'll see a recycling sign. And as a consumer, you'll be like, great, toss it in the recycling bin. But it doesn't get recycled. Why doesn't it get recycled? Because the pump tops themselves are not recyclable. And if the pump tops are attached to that plastic bottle, the whole thing goes to landfill. And so that now the first conclusion you might draw is, oh, it's up to the consumer to remove the cap and put it in recycling and put the other one in the trash. Keep I don't I don't think it should be up to the consumer to do that. I think that there should be way more pressure and expectation on the business the source business. yeah it's got to go to the source so that's that's what i think again simple daily actions meaningful lasting change meaning don't put all the pressure on yourself as the individual to make the change or to to do everything all at once start with one simple thing so an example i would say is hey support us and support um ground soap and start with a lip balm. Everyone uses lip balm every single day. Just get one with a paper tube. It's not a massive change, but it's a simple daily action that you can start. It's just like changing your diet. You know what I mean? Mm. And then the other thing is don't blame yourself. Put more pressure on the corporations and the government. Thank you. Now, Glenn, I'm going to come up to you. One of the things that you said, um, you folks have been doing this for about 13 years, roughly. What kind of knock on effects have you seen within your own life in terms of going about producing the soap that you produce and seeing the benefits and who's been using them? What kind of things come into your world that you stop and say, okay, I've got to reflect myself on what it is that I'm doing. What's the knock on effect of kind of being in this kind of environment, trying to uh, build a sustainable uh, approach to things? Well, yeah, I think it's just that being in that environment forces you to think about it. And so you are thinking about it both for your company and your customers, but you're also thinking about it for yourself. And that, um, allows you to draw some lines between things that you maybe wouldn't have drawn before um, and see some some things that are being overlooked that you wouldn't have seen before. Um, and I think that happens all the time when I look at, you know, the, the things that we do um, or try to do and then uncover from that. Um, and so, yeah, we just sort of react as, as we go. But it's, um, I, I wouldn't say there's any sort of big effect that I've seen from from that just it is a daily thing where you look at something and you go wow that's wasteful and how could we change that and I think the idea of how could we change that um, I love Steve's idea that you know it's not about the person it's not about you should feel bad about not throwing something in your recycling or for buying something that wasn't recyclable um, it's it's that it's not up to you it's what you go and get at the store is what's at the store we need to make what's at the store a source better and more sustainable. We should, we should make it not allowed um, to, to have things in packaging that is totally unsustainable. And like Julie's operation is fantastic for that. I mean, think about how much deferring of plastic you can do just by doing what she is allowing people to do. That's the ideal thing. Everyone go shop there because that's what you should be doing. <laughs> that's, that's the first thing that you as a consumer could do. I think, you know, and it's stuff like that. And those are the kinds of things when, when I see that, I'm like, good, that's exactly what we need to be doing. When I, when I look at the challenges we're all faced, those are the kinds of things we need to give people better options. People are busy. People are doing their things mm -hmm. all the time and we can't expect them constantly looking at it from our eyes. That's not the job. The job is to, you know, give them options that are much, much easier to do the right things uh, every day.
Fantastic answer. So I, I don't even have to be here as the host. Uh, Glenn has allowed me to segue right back up to you, Julie. It's like we planned this, guys. <laughs> okay, so, Glenn. <laughs> so I left you last with the uh, word greenwashing. So I wanted to do two things in this conversation. I wanted to define greenwashing for me, a person who may not know, but also I want you to tell me how many pieces of plastic you've displaced. But then I also want you to tell me as a consumer, when I walk into your shop, if I had to know one thing, one thing to think about, what would you, what question your purchases? What is the one thing that I should be thinking about when I leave your shop to be like a more mindful and awareful person? So greenwashing, how many pieces of plastic have you like totally diverted? And what should I know as a consumer? Okay. Well, you gave one answer away, so that's good. <laughs> um, so greenwashing is basically a marketing strategy that big corporations can get away with. Um, a lot of the little symbols um, that chasing triangle or the chasing arrow symbol, a lot of it is not regulated by either the US or Canada. So a lot of companies can put those little symbols on plastic packaging and get away with it because it's not regulated. Um, a lot of it isn't. And I feel so terrible that people find that little chasing arrow symbols as a comfort blanket knowing that it's going to be recycled and it's going to be taken care of and I can buy this product knowing that it's going to be recycled when we definitely can't recycle our way out of this plastic problem and I know this is a climate uh, climate change uh, meeting however plastic is really dear to my heart and You're with talking. that being said <laughs> we have we have diverted up to now and this is only the refillable uh, refillable products so i think we're up to just about fifty thousand pieces but that doesn't include any of the you know the dishwasher pod containers that we refill the spice containers that we refill so we're way up there that's basically our shampoo okay. and detergent let, let me pause you for a second can you say that yeah. number again please we're about fifty thousand on shampoos and detergents <laughs> and so 50,000, I'm thinking like one person, uh, every person in Cornell has been able to like, that's a big yes. number, Julie. Oh yes. my God. Let's make it go up. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right. So now I've got that excitement out of the way. I walk into your shop and uh, yeah. I, I'd like to start my journey, if you will. Um, we're not going to talk about the top products to purchase, but what, what kind of mentality should I be leaving your shop with so that I can continue in this kind of process of thinking? You will leave the store knowing that you've done something good and that you have hope that what you're doing and your purchases are, are you're going in the right direction. So my my advice to everyone, like you've, you've mentioned, is that um, question everything. So question your purchases. And um, to go back on what Steve said a little bit is that I'm kind of, I don't want to put the blame on the customer or put the onus on the, the consumer. However, I would like, I would ask that everyone be a little mindful when purchasing something. Can I get this refilled or can I get this in a biodegradable container? Just think about things before you just, you know, robotically go to Walmart and pick up Tide and blah, blah, blah. So just think about purchases before you do it. Wonderful. So my friends, we're looking at 733 on my clock. So I'd like to enter into a bit of a uh, conversation together. Okay. <clears throat> so we're just gonna just hop in and just talk to one another. One of the things that uh, based on what I'm seeing is the challenge for the average individual is exactly what you folks have laid out here. Um, I would like to do better. And so I enter into my marketplace and I decide this is where I go do my grocery shopping. And if in that portfolio of options, there are no actual options that reflect my values before Julie, what were my options to be a better person? And so I think about who creates the marketplace, um, who creates the conditions for us to enter into and interact with. And so that takes me up to regulations. You folks are in this wonderful space where you are um, a business of sorts and you interact with what uh, raw goods are available, what uh, taxes and all of these wonderful things that make the ecosystem of commerce alive and well. But one of the things that I've been observing is what is the value of government? So within your own supply chains, 
Is it possible to mandate and regulate activities? Does the government have a role to play in the commerce space? Because the idea is, while it's business, it's hands off, let the free markets kind of reign supreme. If the consumer wants to choose, they'll just vote with their, their pocket. There's a lot of uh, disconnection between those that have a lot of ability to do something and waiting for the person who has not a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of resources to get together by the millions to like make this a thing. My question to you in plain Jane English is, what is the value of regulation within this supply chain space? Julie, I like your voice, so I'm gonna start with you. Um, you know, I, I feel, uh, I'm not sure if I'm gonna answer this question properly, but um, I feel the government, and I'm gonna put my filter on, but that the government can do a lot more than they're doing. Um, greed is is really front line on this. And um, although um, we're doing a lot on on our end and and doing what we possibly can, I think, like Steve said, that problems can be solved like this. And this whole, uh, to an extent, it is the the climate change issue can be resolved fairly quickly if people up there and over there would step in. Thank you, Julie, appreciate you. Steve, and remember this is a family friendly programming and I'm with you in the hot boat, Steve, and I wanna use all of my bar words, but I want you to give me a, an idea of what uh, regulation, what um, kind of assistance there should be available, or what the shape of things could look like um, if we make the best choices available to us. What, what do you think we could be doing better? Could the government be stepping in? What things do you see from your vantage point that could be improved? uh from government standpoint um here's the thing i don't know on an environmental level what the government can do because to be honest i haven't really seen it um and i don't mean that in like a really harsh way like but i just i i'm i have no clue because most of what we've done has been on our own we've had some granting mm -hmm. opportunities which i think has done a little bit but the the legwork and this isn't patting myself on the back mm -hmm. this is the people that i've worked with and all this sort of stuff the the strides that we have made have been largely on our own now mm -hmm. what i do think that or what i have seen the government do is respond to a global pandemic and in a matter of a year they have been able to make uh where are we at now in the province of ontario of those eligible, 80, 80 North of 80. Yep. are vaccinated now. When we first started that global pandemic, they said it would take us at minimum 18 months to get a vaccination. Well, the first vaccination rolled out in about 10. So we, that's how we know that they're capable. Um, it's the classic where there's a will, there's a way. So yes. I, what concerns me um, is, you know, there's, there were, I believe there were a lot less scientists um, warning us about a pandemic in the past decade than there were scientists warning us about climate change mm -hmm. and a climate catastrophe. Mm -hmm. And what on it like genuinely concerns me and became more visceral and real to me, and I could have dropped an F-bomb, but I didn't. What What is more visceral and real to me in the last uh, where are we at now, 18 months or whatever it's been, is that bad stuff can happen mm -hmm. in the modern era. You know what I mean? It was like, mm -hmm. oh, World War II is way past us. Nuclear warfare, it's way past us. That, that's not happening. We're in the bright new era, and then we get hit with a global pandemic. And we're this generation is hit back now into the reality that this stuff can really happen. And some massive uh, climate catastrophe i think could happen and could potentially be worse than the pandemic and look at what that has done and so i believe that the government has the ability clearly to rally and make a change but i'm afraid the government is reactive not proactive and i'm worried that it's going to be I don't know about too late, but a lot of damage will be done before any major action is happening. I agree. 
Mr. Glenn, to you for the F-bombs that uh, Steve totally avoided. Um, what are your thoughts? What are the things that are missing from the equation um, to help foster the, this, this, this reality that we can have climate change solutions in the present time versus waiting till we have expired um, situations on our hands to deal with? So what are your thoughts in terms of what could be better applied to our society, whether it's government or not, or what have you? Yeah, I think there, you know, those two entities are quite different, corporate society or corporate entities and government. They're, they're, they act completely differently. One is, you know, almost in opposition of the other mm -hmm. um, and at the same time is meant to facilitate the other. And, you know, we have a situation now with climate change where I don't know if anyone watched the, the intro of the, the COP26 thing a couple of weeks ago. Um, it, you know, the state of the union here is if you if you believe that, which I hope you do, is almost a disaster at this point. And you know what they're saying is that the, 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 it's sort of nebulous what's happening, right? We have fires, we have floods, we have all of these things that we can see. And here sitting in our, you know, nice little Cornwall, Ontario, we don't necessarily feel the effects of that, right? We can see it on TV. Uh, a lot of places they are feeling it. There are a lot of places that are going to be underwater soon. Their houses are going to be underwater. Where they live will be under the ocean. And that's something that we all have to sort of square and have to go, well, where does that leave us? And where it leaves us is with a, a bigger problem than climate change itself, I think. It leaves us with a world where we are going to have, you know, a fifth of the world migrating, moving, looking for a new place to live. And what do you think that will do? When, and you look at, you know, a lot of people's attitude towards immigration in the United States, you know, any immigration is horrible for them. They just think that that's, that's a, you know, an offense. And it's like, well, that's only the beginning of a very, very long immigration story on this planet, mm -hmm. if, if we mm -hmm. continue. And, you know, so we all have to get very used to that. How can governments help that? Well, I go back to where the problem is. Why, why are we still stuck here? And it's because there are certain corporate actors who are using the playbook of the, the cigarette industry, just so doubt, you know, pay your own scientists and, and so doubt in the science to just keep it going long enough to make another few hundred billion. And I mean, is that worth it to all of us? Is that really what we all want? You know, is that really what serves us so that we can drive our, you know, internal combustion engine cars a little longer? I just don't see how we can do the math, even as, as individuals, and come out with an, a conclusion that says that, no, now isn't the time that we need to be doing something about this. Now is the time. We all have to ask ourselves, you know, do we put pressure on our governments? Do we put pressure on our corporations? I think you've got to look at the, the ignorance of those corporations, the oil and gas industry, okay. uh, our own governments for still in sponsoring that. I mean, why are we doing that? Why is it being done in our name? You know, mm -hmm. that's, it disgusts me that we're still doing that. And I'm sorry, my sister lives in Alberta, you know, like, and, and, and makes money from that industry. But at the same time, at some point, you've got to read the writing on the wall and say, look, we need to make a change here. We absolutely have to change this for the good of all of us on this planet. And, you know, if you're, if you're of the mind that, well, I've got lots of money and so I can stay here in my castle and move and I have my bunker and all that and it's not going to affect me and I may be the last guy standing. If that's your attitude, then okay. But we can't all afford to have that attitude because that's not the situation we're all in. The situation we're all in is that we've got to look around us to our communities and say, what can we do? How can we do this? And to me, that's, that's where we're at. And that's the kind of pressure we need to be putting on our governments. And we need to be putting that pressure on them to say, no, we don't want these industries to behave this way anymore. And we don't want to help them behave this way, certainly. And we want to regulate them so that they don't. And that's probably our only hope. Glenn, <laughs> Steve, <laughs> sorry. Really? No, no, this is good. This is, this is, I've been waiting for this good. conversation. There's another section of this whole project called Harder Talks, and it's where we like F-bomb and talk about really like hard greenwashing and things that we see that's going on. We can't have this conversation right now, but while I've got my glasses off and I can very sternly say, um, I'm born in Edmonton, Alberta, just so you know, Glenn, I, I have no, um, no animosity with what you said there, but uh, <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, I love them. I love going there and I love lots of people there. Like I say, yeah, I've got across family the board. It's love not Canada. a good So now we've got about 16 minutes. I'm just going to check in with my man with the hands behind the scene. We've got 15 minutes. I'd like to open up the floor to the audience. I'm working through Zoom. 
And I think my first mistake would have been to uh, not open up the uh, town hall on Facebook. So you give me one second to get myself here. And then I'm pretty sure that I'm gonna have some questions for you folks in just a second. Bap, bap. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. All right, so let me just make sure that I don't have any comments in the Zoom box. No comments here, folks. So I'm just going to move over to our Facebook comments section. And uh, first of all, Julie, you've been uh, noted as a fantastic place to shop. Just a heads up. Um, I'm hey. seeing a note come through. Go ahead, Zach, when you have a moment. So I've got a question from the audience. This is from uh, Jennifer McIsaac. And she's asking, do you have any suggestions of initiatives municipal governments should be adopting? So whoever is the most keen can answer that question. Who wants to answer a question about municipal governments? You're not wrong. There's no authority here and no authority is knocking on your door, but do you want to maybe wager an answer for this individual? The question again is, do you have any suggestions of initiatives municipal governments should be adopting? Any takers? I can make a comment. Please. Uh, I was hearing today that, uh, you know, in Ottawa, with the Ottawa city government, there's, there's some talk about them implementing their own climate policy. I think there was some talk in Cornwall here on council yep. about that just recently. I find that incredibly impressive. I mean, who that, that's, that, that can only do good. Us here at a community level can make a lot of change and we can certainly uh, <coughs> turn our radar on for that kind of change to be available to us as a city. And I'm, I, if that's true and if that's actually happening, I encourage it 100%. Beyond that, I, I'm not sure, but certainly uh, to start with our city council, that's a great, great call. And let's figure out as a city what we can be doing. Julie, it that's sounds like you're gonna be the backup singer here. What were you gonna say? <laughs> I was just going to uh, piggyback on that. It is, I, I just read that as well. And I was like, the, the Cornwall declares um, climate emergency. I was like, what was happening? This is really happening. I'm so happy. <laughs> it's great. We just need more education on it. And uh, yeah, it, it's really good. It's a really good initiative. Yep. Well, and all climate, all climate emergency means is that we have better options. We have more yep. tools that we can use when it's declared an emergency. I think that's fantastic. Yeah. Perfect. Steve, you're sitting there like Bruce Wayne waiting to hatch an egg there. Uh, what are your thoughts there? <laughs> no, I mean, it's funny because the first thing that goes to my mind is what can a municipality do and what powers do they have? And I just really like hearing this idea of getting some heads together and just that mm -hmm. declaration of a state of emergency is awesome. And then, then determining what a municipality actually can do. I don't know, like, I can't think of any initiatives other than like in Cornwall, like let's get bike lanes and let's get uh, composting. Although I don't know how much composting would relate directly to climate change, but. Buddy, I'll let you finish and then I'll slide in some like work stuff on you in a second about uh, composting. But yeah, if you're done, Steve. No, I'm done. But like, that's the thing. Like, I don't have any specific thing, like, you know, great baby idea eggs in my brain. That's okay. But um, just the idea that a municipality can actually take some ownership by declaring an emergency and trying to do something. I think that's an amazing first step. I think that's kind of revolutionary in terms of where we've been in the last 20 years. Well, my friends, it seems like the comment section is getting lit. Um, so give me a second here while I try to, hmm. So I have questions and the, it, it seems like you guys are engaging people at the high level. Um, they're, they're going for municipal questions. They're going for um, GHG reduction questions. Uh, another note about composting, food cycler initiatives. Um, so while I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask Zach to su supplement me with any additional questions at this point in time, I've reviewed the information that's there, but I wanna have a conversation really quickly while we're here about composting. Julie, <clears throat> talk to you really quickly about this. Um, composting, whether you have a uh, plugged in unit or whether you've got a <laughs> low tech unit, at the end of the day, it's something that has to be done. Um, 2025, the Ontario um, government has mandated that every municipality in Ontario has to have an organic diversion program in place by 2025, okay? In the most best case scenario in California, if you're not putting organic waste to the curb, if there's an absence of waste matter, they are going to fine you. That's, that's not awesome. what's going to take place here, and that's not what I'm trying to push or say. But what I'm saying is organic waste is so important to have it out of our landfills, and here's why. We're all familiar with carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide oh, yes. is yes, 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 of course. Yeah, yeah. the bane of our existence, right? The Canadian <laughs> government tracks 
seven greenhouse gases. I'm not going to give you the periodic table. I'm not going to explain it all to you, but the first one is carbon dioxide. The second one is methane. And the third one is carbon, uh, sorry, nitrous oxide. Now with methane, methane is 80 times worse than carbon dioxide. I want you to keep that in mind. So we've been fighting this carbon dioxide thing for a whole time, but there's a whole nother guy that's worse. Nitrous oxide is 20 times, 20,000 times worse than carbon dioxide. We won't talk about that for a second. Methane, from the source, we're looking at the decaying matter. Think of your banana peels. Think of your, your apple cores. Think of all of your, um, your produce that you throw into your garbage. When that gets to the landfill, the activity that's taking place there is going to produce methane. And that methane is going to be released into our atmosphere. Now, methane is an, um, an interesting setup. Methane, even though it's 80 times worse than carbon dioxide, it actually has less time in the atmosphere. It has less of a life. So if we can easily take out the methane part of the equation of emissions, we now have the ability to bring down drastically a lot of the affluent that's up there. Now, with composting, when we think of um, diverting our organic matter away, the really cool thing is every individual has a relationship with waste. Every individual can take a moment to say, do I have to put this in the garbage? I know we went through this activity with recycling and the government has to step in to make that recycling system way better. Um, and also at the source and also at the point for us as consumers. But when we talk about composting, if every individual can divert their um, organic matter away and we can actually utilize that, we can even turn it, uh, we've got a great cogen project that is going on at the wastewater treatment facility that is gonna be able to take um, some solid matter, convert it into energy, and there's gonna be different uses for that energy. So if we can get organic matter out of that equation and maybe streamline into another process, we can then take our waste and turn it into energy. We can take our waste and get it out of the landfills. We can actually increase the life cycle of our landfills, but more importantly, uh, reduce the amount of, <clears throat> excuse me, methane going up into our atmosphere. So composting is extremely important. Um, it'll be something that this project's going to address in the best way it can. So I thank you, Steve, for that comment. And I thank you, Julie, for continuing the conversation. Now, let me take a look here. Apparently we've got pictures being sent. This is gonna be a first for me. I haven't uh, received pictures uh, as a comment. So Zach, the picture is not coming through. It's either you're gonna to have to send me a description, screenshot it yourself, or um, find a new way to get this to me, buddy. But uh, I don't have that information. Now, we've got about eight minutes left. Zach's gonna send me a message. I'm gonna give you guys the floor really quickly. And is there anything you wanna bring up or is there anything that is, came up in our conversation that you're like, you know what, I wanna come back to that for a second. So I'm gonna start with you, I'm gonna say Glenn, and then I'm gonna to go to you, Steve, and I'm gonna end with Julie. So let me just go through my side of comments. I'll be right, right back. Glenn, thoughts on the conversation, buddy? Oh, uh, well, I guess sort of what you're asking for is a summary or uh, you know, sure. uh, just a general thoughts. I, I just wanna to say to people um, that my thinking about this is that I feel like I need to be ready for what's to come. There are big changes to come. There's no question about that because that's what's required. And if big changes aren't on the horizon, there's gonna be big changes anyways. <laughs> so we all need to get ready for this. We all need to get ready to, to you know, get on board and get involved. And I think if we all just have that attitude of like, you know, let's not just doubt everything we're hearing. Let's not fight about it. Let's try to solve it. That's, that's what I would say because so much of this in, in our modern world seems to be, you know, we, we tend to argue about everything and we tend to look at all the sides. And, and I think that if people could just, uh, you know, look at the reality of what we're facing, um, this is a common enemy and we should all see it that way. And that's just, you know, the way that I kind of feel about it. I just hope that I can, I can bring some of that to this community uh, whenever possible is that, you know, none of us are wrong. None of us are every, always right. Um, we should all be able to just talk about it and, and find the best ways of getting the information across to each other and sharing it and staying a strong community throughout all that. Steve, your thoughts, sir? Um, I don't have one specific thought. Something that just stood out to me, though, just with respect to the composting thing, mm -hmm. um, how they're how we can turn more waste almost like even redefining how we look at the word waste do you know what i mean like mm -hmm. 
like a redefinition of waste because there really is no waste. And if you go into a natural setting, you'll see there is no waste. Like you think sure. about, mm -hmm. yeah, you think about the tree that falls in the forest and what's the term when it, it's almost like a nursing tree or something because it births other things. Like, nursery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. The more we can adopt that mentality at the personal level, at the community level, at the municipal level, like really reworking the way we look at waste, um, I think we'll have it made. And get rid of water from your... <laughs> Water's going to be the next big thing, guys. Um, it's not a joke. So when, Steve, you say that now, and I know what you're saying, and uh, I, I hope that I don't have to sit in front of a screen in five years from now and say, like, hey, Steve, let's talk about the water shortage. But we're supposed to talk about the water shortage in Africa, the South African, the countdown. So we might close on that in a second. Julie, what have you noticed from this conversation that you've taken forward or maybe something you want to revisit? I guess maybe if I can leave people with something is that this whole think this whole climate change and the issues around it can be overwhelming for a lot of people. So I think if you just start small and just do little changes, I know we're all at different levels in our uh, waste reduction game, or maybe we're not in it at all, but just start with something small. Don't be overwhelmed. You know, it could start with, you could start with just paper towel, just not buy paper towel anymore and just go back to cloths or or something simple you know just there's different ways just not to be overwhelmed with it just little baby steps very good um okay so i'm going to take an opportunity because this comment came through so apparently we've got people uh within the prescott russell area and they're in the process of joining the partners for climate change protection program I will tell you that the city of Cornell is also considering that as well. Be sure to follow um, the city council as they move through this process of the climate change declaration. Um, that's my piece from the comment section. I've got about four minutes left on the clock. Um, what is it that I want to leave you fine folks with? I want to let you guys know that we have a survey that's out and about. I'm sure that you guys have taken the time to uh, do it. If you have, thank you. If you've got people coming through your areas, remind them that this is an opportunity. It's a rare moment in my experience of being a resident in Eastern Ontario. It's very rare when the institution comes to the public and says, what are your thoughts? What would you like us to know? So the survey is an opportunity to provide folks with a conduit to give information. It'll be used and considered, but this is an opportunity for us to dialogue. Beyond that, we've got a website that's coming out. Now, when we talk about greenwashing, separate conversation, on this website, we have what is called a carbon calculator. And the carbon calculator is meant to help people on their journey, whether they're beginning their journey or they're in the middle of their journey, just to give them an idea and a sense of what the relationship with is with their emissions. That website will be available soon enough. Beyond that, my friends, I've got a uh, town hall tomorrow with a climate change professor from Carleton University. So as much as I love you fine folks, one of the great challenges of this project is to find people that are specific to the actual climate change issue. So if you're interested in the conversation that was taking place today, make time tomorrow night to have this conversation again. And by have the conversation, show up with some popcorn, take in the information. And so this is what it's all about. The more that we are comfortably talking about things, I haven't been able to sit across from you guys and point at somebody and say they're wrong. There's information that you're aware of that I'm not aware of that when we talk together, there's things that we can come together on and say, hey, this is something we can uh, we can pull from one another and make our own solutions. So I want to take the last two minutes to thank you all very much. I've got Glenn Forrester representing one half of the fantastic team that is Ground Soap. I've got the mighty Steve Rebel. I'm gonna call you Rebel. I know yeah. it's not Rebel. <laughs> not even close. Not even close. It's good enough. I like it. I, you know yeah. what? I've decided to go with Rebel because it's so much easier. You get a tattoo. <laughs> so that's Steve from Etty who's been available to us. And then we have a uh, local homegrown hero insofar as Julie Denny, who's come to us from the local film. I hope that you folks take the time behind the scenes to have a conversation. I think there's some great things that are going on there. I'm going to take an opportunity to plug the River Institute. Wait, wait, there's a button for this. One second, guys. The River Institute, folks. So those fine folks have allowed this project to uh, be fulfilled. But for you guys that are in the background, Glenn, Steve, Julie, 
um, there is the River Lab. So if you guys start thinking of innovative things that you want to be doing uh, and you need a scientific institution to provide you with quantitative data or maybe do some proposal writing or find private partnerships and so forth, we have a department that is dedicated to that. So as you grow out your smart stuff, bring your smart stuff to us and we'll get it uh, quote unquote certified for you. Are there any questions for the guy in the red jacket and the fancy glasses? No? Fantastic. So on behalf of future climate leaders, Thank you for addressing our awareness and helping us make choices so that we can make good actions and change our behaviors to be more in line with the planet. My name is Lee Theodore on behalf of Future Climate Leaders. I'm so happy you've taken the time to listen to us and I hope that you tune into the next one. And until then, I hope that you uh, question your purchases and you care the uh, planet and your thoughts. And uh, other than that, stay aware, my friends. You guys can get out of here now. You guys, I'll bump into you guys soon. You guys are amazing. I'm so happy. This is our local meeting, guys. This is great. Thank you. Take it easy, guys. Bye. Thank you. Take care, guys. Bye. Bye.